This is the web transcription service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. On October the 23rd, at the annual Trafalgar Niobe Luncheon hosted by the RCMI and the Naval Association of Canada, Mr. Roger Litwiller spoke to the gathering about Voices of Our Sailors Past, stories from survivors of HMCS Trentonian. Good. Well, thank you very much for inviting me here today. I, I've uh, always enjoyed uh, coming and viewing our history and talking to our veterans and, and discovering what is out there. And, and for me, this is the first time I've been to the uh, Royal Canadian Military Institute, and, and I'm sorry that it's taken me this long to get here. Um, Today I'm going to talk about my Veterans of the Battle of Atlantic, which is directly from the research from my book, Warships of the Bay of Quinney. But before we do that, I have a little uh, Trafalgar uh, connection for you. And uh, what does the Canadian Navy have in connection with Trafalgar? And it's very quite simple, but elaborate at the same time. Starts off in Boston by a family named by the name of Hollowell. And Benjamin Hollowell Sr. was the tax collector in Boston. And we all kind of know through history what happened with that. They threw him a party. Uh, didn't go over well. <laughs> so the, the Hollowell family fled. Uh, they had already sent their youngest son, Benjamin Jr., to the UK where he was enrolled in school. And with that, he ended up joining the Royal Navy. And Benjamin Jr. Hollowell made very close friends with another young naval officer by the name of Horatio. And the two of them became fast friends. And in fact, they became known as the group of Band of Brothers. <clears throat> Throughout that time, both men, their careers moved forward. Horatio's moved a little faster than Benjamin's. But Benjamin was in command of HMS Swift, Swiftshire at the Battle of the Nile. And during that battle, Swiftshire took Lorient, the flagship of the French Navy. And when Lorient exploded, a large chunk of her mast landed on Swiftshire's deck. With that, Benjamin Jr. had his carpenters take that piece of mast and he made it into a coffin. And on that coffin he engraved, To my Lord Nelson, may you accept this gift from a ship that was taken during your illustrious Battle of the Nile. And when the time comes, may you be buried in your prize and then added as a postscript, and may that day not come for some time. Well, the other officers were absolutely aghast that this ship's captain would prevent, present Admiral Nelson with this coffin as a gift. But he was so taken up with it, that coffin actually followed him wherever he went from that point on, to the extent that that coffin, made from Lorient's mast, presented by Captain Benjamin Hollowell, is the first coffin that he's buried in, inside the sarcophagus in the UK. So he indeed was truly buried in it. Now the Hollowell family was given large tracts of land throughout Canada, including what, what at the time was most of Prince Edward County. And there is still a Hollowell Township in that county. Hence the HMCS Hollowell, the frigate from the Second World War, was named after Hollowell because the name Picton was too close to the already established Picto, which was a minesweeper. So our frigate Hollowell is named for the Hollowell family, which gave their name to the Hollowell Township who fought alongside Nelson at the Nile and was good friends with the Admiral. Now that, a lot of that 
is all covered in my first book, Warships of the Bay of Quinney. Okay, so my lecture, Veterans of Our Voices Past. Often when we talk about our sailors and our Navy, we talk about this, and that's a, a great Navy photo, a broadside, three-quarter shot of a Canadian Navy ship, HMCS Trentonian. And that's the pictures we think of when we think of our ships. When we talk about our sailors, and there they are, Trentonian Ships Company, all very looking, looking very pusser, dress blues, all lined up on deck, beautiful Ships Company photo. Those white streaks are snow, it's January in Halifax. Notice no gray coats. When we talk about our veterans, generally this is what we talk about. Our, our elder gentlemen and ladies, you know, in their blue blazers, attending ceremonies. But realistically, and in all honesty, when we talk about our Navy and our sailors and our veterans, we need to talk about these guys. Because these are the same guys in 1944. And that's where our stories need to come from. We need to tell the stories of our Navy from the perspective of the sailors that have served. Now, part of the stories that I collected from my book on Warships of the Bay of Quinney, when I found one of the veterans, and I managed to interview off and on in one form or another about 35 sailors from the ship, I had a list of questions. Because often I would meet with one of them and they'd say, well, yeah, I was there, but it was 70 years ago, and I don't know what I could tell you. And I would say, well, days and times, forget it. I'm not interested. Tell me about your mess. Tell me about your mates. Tell me about the food. And the one gentleman, four hours later, he finally stopped talking and he says, yeah, I don't know if I've been able to tell you anything. So I had these set questions that I asked them. And one of them was, what was the food like? And they all pretty much gave the same answer. It was one of the few questions where everybody had the same memory. The food was decent. It wasn't fantastic. You know, there was a bit of variety, but the cook always seemed to serve red lead and bacon a lot. <laughs> so now, most of the people in the room know what that is, but that's stewed tomatoes and bacon, right? It was pretty much a staple. Yeah. And then I ran into one of the cooks, but I couldn't ask him what was the food like. So I asked him, you know, what did you, what did you make? And he explained to me, he says, well, he says, I never cooked a day in my life before I joined the Navy. And a few weeks later, I was at sea cooking for 100 guys. He says, I did what I could. I cooked what they gave me. I tried to mix it up as best as I could. I think I did OK. He says, but there was one meal that I absolutely loved. He says, in fact, I'm having it for supper tonight. He says, I couldn't get enough of that red lead and bacon. <laughs> <clears throat> so a lot of these pictures you're seeing today are coming from this gentleman, Alan Singleton. He was a sick bay attendant, the Tiffy in Trentonian. And being, you know, a young crew, as most of you know, there's not a lot of sick call, except when there's hard work to be done. <laughs> so he didn't have a whole lot to do, but he was an avid photographer. And he would take his browning and he would take pictures of everything that the ship did turned his sick bay into his own personal dark room, developed, developed the photos, put them up on the bulletin board and sold them to the rest of the crew. And that's how he financed his photography uh, hobby. Well, many of the crew managed to retain their photos and, and for Trentonian, I've been able to collect over 300 of these photos from, uh, that were taken by this gentleman and, and other members of the crew. And many of those you're going to see, not, not many, you're going to see about 25 of those today. So, as many of you know, living in board ship is a, is a series of contrasts. You know, one thing will be just the opposite shortly thereafter. And this is one of my favorite photos. And many of the sailors will know 
exactly where this is. This is off the Grand Banks. You know, 1944, the Herodon coming back from Newfoundland. Skipper, you know, came up on the bridge, asked the uh, Aztec operator, you know, if there was any contacts. The reply was, yes, sir, biological. Skipper says, confirmed biological. The reply was, confirmed biological. And next thing everybody knows, they're ringing up action stations. And the skipper's ordering full revs, and Trentonian goes racing out at 16 knots, and turns about and comes racing back in, and the skipper orders one depth charge. And off goes the depth charge. They go racing out again, comes again, changes heading back in, and the skipper orders all stop. And the younger guys are saying, you know, what's the old man doing? He's going to get us killed. We're off the Grand Banks. There's submarines out here. What do you mean we're stopping? In the meantime, the boat's crew is being lowered, ordered to the boat, and the boat's being lowered. All the guys from the Maritimes, they've already got the stones and the knives out, and, and they're already sharpening their stones. Boat goes out, comes back, and this is what they brought in. Full load. Fresh Atlantic seafood. It was quickly uh, cleaned, red made ready. The cooks already had milk, milk on the burners, and they had the most incredible seafood feast these men ever described. And, and this was one of those common memories from everybody that was there. It was the best seafood we have ever had. Now you move forward a few months. This is Milford Haven in, uh, uh, I believe it was August 44. So Trentonian, it's already gone through the Normandy invasion and all the escorting jobs related to it. It's now time for some boiler cleaning. It's one of the few times they're actually tied up alongside. And if you take a good look at that picture, do you see all those seagulls on the roof there? And you see all those boxes and everything on the uh, alongside. Well, that ship directly off to St uh, Trentonian's uh, starboard bow and directly ahead. Those are both fishing trawlers. <laughs> the trawlers would come in with their catch, come up alongside. Everything would be unloaded onto the seawall there. They were gutted, cleaned, head off, tails off, fins off, flayed. And the meat went into the plant. For processing and you see all that crap laying on the yeah well that's all heads and tails and guts and at the end of the day they came out with shovels and they cleaned it up straight into the water pushed everything into the water alongside and their Transonian sat for 10 days in <laughs> August <laughs> seafood was never served again in the ship. Uh, Lieutenant Bill Harrison, the tall gentleman on the uh, left side of that photo, was her skipper. And, and they all recounted a lot of fond memories about uh, Harrison, you know, saying he was a very fair officer. He was genuinely interested in the well-being of his, of his ship's company. And, and he even went a little over the top sometimes when it came to transgressions. You know, on more than one occasion, he would dismiss a charge you know, due to, you know, for whatever reason he could pull out of his hat just so that the sailor wouldn't have to suffer. Uh, they did say he rarely came to anger, but they did see him on two occasions. Uh, one was uh, two of his officers, uh, Lieutenant Dodds and Lieutenant Pear. They were good friends before the war, they joined up and ended up serving in the same corvette. Uh, both very athletic officers and uh, you know because they were good friends and they'd always been chummy you know a little bit of horsing around between them was not uncommon and this is actually the two of them up on the forecastle taking on fuel in Bermuda having a bit of a sparring session while they're passing the time well later on when they were in uh, Liverpool and this is late May of 44 uh, things are about to get uh, pretty sticky, so the skipper gives everybody, uh, half the crew, uh, uh, an evening's leave. 
and Dodds and Pear are standing on the jetty waiting for their taxi being, you know, gentlemen, they, they don't walk into town. And uh, when all of a sudden, um, uh, Pear grab, reaches over and grabs Dodds' cap off his head and tucks it underneath his left arm, just like he's carrying a football, and he goes racing down the jetty. Um, and shortly after, Dodds close behind, being an actual football, football athlete, goes tearing after him, and with a giant leap, he grabs hold of his fellow officer, tackles him to the concrete jetty, and the two of them crash in a crumpled heap. And as various sailors that witnessed it say, at that point, you heard a crack that could have been heard around the fleet, followed by a scream as the young navigator's femur snapped in two. Yeah. The ambulance came, took him away. The other junior officer was immediately brought into the captain's cabin where they heard a berating that was wholly unprofessional. There was cursing and swearing and, and it was heard from stem to stern. And the crew couldn't understand because words were coming out like, you have endangered this entire ship's company. This will affect what's going to happen to us. How could you do something so stupid? What they did not know was the young navigator had all the plans and the times for the invasion that Trentonian was supposed to leave on in the next couple of days. So a new officer was brought in, had to learn everything on the go, and it carried on. So Jack Harold was one of the other gentlemen that I was fortunate enough to speak to. And he talked about the invasion through a diary that he had written at the time. And these are his own words directly from his diary. The old man called the crew together for a pep talk on what is about to happen. I'm going to have a ringside seat to the biggest thing in warfare that man has ever conceived or attempted. We are now in the English Channel, shepherding our convoy like a big wandering flock of sheep under the watchful eye of British fighter and bomber aircraft. This strip of water will in a day or two, without a doubt, become the hottest spot on earth. And I shall be at the very vortex of this man-made hell. In case I do not survive, perhaps someday someone will say, he died doing his duty. It has been estimated that 85% of the men taking part in this invasion will not come out of it alive. Well, everyone is hoping that he will be one of that 15%, but also resolved to go down fighting if he is not. Jack Harold was 22 when he wrote that. And there's the invasion. Trentonian arrived off the beaches the morning after on the 7th. And all night they were sitting on the opposite side of the channel, watching the flashes, hearing the news reports, and the, during the night, sailing steadily forward, escorting a convoy of block ships, knowing that they were going into battle at literally six knots of speed. Bruce Keir, Keir made a, uh, an interesting uh, comment about the invasion. After they had escorted their block ships to where they were to be sunk, um, they took and dropped anchor. Shortly after that, a troop ship sailed by them. And it was Canadian troops on board. And as soon as they saw the maple leaf on Trentonian's funnel, the Canadian troops started cheering. And as soon as they realized they were Canadian troops on the troop ship, Trentonians started cheering back. And then they realized the troops were cheering in French and the Corvette crew was cheering in English and it quickly changed to jeers. And the comments flying back and forth and all in good fun and the troop ship suddenly dropped her anchor right there alongside Trentonian. And the air was filled with absolute commotion, you know, the anchor chains slipping and dropping, 
and then the orders and the PA systems calling up the men and the alarm bells, the landing craft going over the side and the sailors or the soldiers clamoring down the nets. And you could hear the curses as they would slam into the side of the ship. And this whole noise just penetrated the air. And the crew of Trentonian is watching all this taking place right beside them. And one by one, the landing craft start moving away from the ship, filled with soldiers, and they start forming a line. And as the line is formed, they start racing into the beaches. And with that, the crew of Trentonian gives their, their French-Canadian counterparts three cheers. And they watch them as they disappear. And as the noise from the big motors of the landing craft slowly fade away, the air becomes silent and nobody on board Trentonian is talking and then they realize those men that they just saw how many of them would still be alive by nightfall one of the incidents Trentonian was involved in was with this ship uh, again shortly after the invasion this is the cable layer monarch and she was part of the program to lay a communication cable direct from England onto the beaches at Normandy. It was a top secret mission. And um, this is Harrison in the background there with the cap off. That's the new officer navigator for Trentonian, a fellow by the name of Jack Macbeth. Does anybody recognize that name? Yeah, he's written quite a few naval books. Um, so anyways, on the night of the 13th, Trentonia was escorting the cable layer Monarch to the beaches, laying a cable at a very slow speed of about two to three knots. When out of the darkness, a couple of e-boats came through and uh, passed right down alongside the ships. There was no battle that took part. The uh, S-Dick operator also heard torpedoes in the water at one point. Uh, but again, they couldn't pick up an Aztec contact. And during the day, there was a couple of German um, aircraft that bombed some ships within uh, very close range of them. So they, they had had submarines, they had e-boats, they had uh, aircraft in a very short 24-hour period in direct contact. And then out of the night darkness, suddenly they were illuminated by star shells. And immediately thereafter, shelling started to take place up on Trentonian. And the shells came in. Some of them actually passed between the mast and the uh, superstructure, the bridge. Fortunately, they missed. And Harrison, in quick thinking, started flashing his recognition lights. And with that, the fire stopped, but it was moved directly to Monarch. And within five minutes, Monarch took 80 rounds of 5-inch ammunition, completely destroying our upper works, carrying away the, the cable, killing several of the crew, wounding many others. You can see the splinter damage uh, in the cable ship there. And that's the skipper of Monarch being transferred over to Trentonian. Uh, unfortunately, it was all fired on by USS Plunkett, uh, an American destroyer that mistook Trentonian and the cable ship for German e-boats. That was the other time they saw Harrison get angry. He was actually leaning out over the rail yelling at the, the US destroyer. And then when the uh, ensign came over with the captain's apologies, um, they actually had to refrain several of the crew members from taking their revenge. Uh, this is one of the photos from the collection from the Trentonian sailors, uh, the Juno Beach Lightship. When I showed these pictures to Rich Gimlet, the uh, past curator for the Canadian Navy, um, he stopped me at this one. He says, you know, there has never been a photo that he's seen of the Juno Beach Lightship in position off the beachhead. Another one of my favorite photos, uh, can you see the gentleman on the, uh, on the boy? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. On the mooring boy? Yeah. 
most of the Trentonians time was spent uh, tied up out in the uh, uh, away from the jetties during that time and some say it was because of the attack by the Americans they didn't want the sailors going ashore uh, spreading word that this friendly fire incident had taken place others say it was just because they were really busy but they ended up doing 49 days continuous duty uh, and not getting ashore so after a while the lower decks decided okay we're not getting ashore we're not getting any time off they stockpiled their grog issue for a few days <laughs> shredded every newspaper in the ship went and got a uh, bearing off one of the uh, guys in the engine room put a mop head on one of the other sailors and they married two of the guys off right there on the four inch gun deck <laughs> The tall guy with the uh, toque on the right is reading from the good book of seamanship. He was the padre. And, uh, and then they broke out the, the rum. And this is another one of those common stories amongst all the, the, the sailors. You, you can tell by those faces. That was just one heck of a party. And they, they all talk a bit about it to this day. Um, once the wedding was over, the newspaper confetti went up and everybody enjoyed themselves up on the forecastle right underneath the bridge. So, next time they're in port, shore leave. <laughs> so when they all went ashore, some took the time and went up to London, uh, while others, you know, took their time and, and visited as many pubs as they could. And these, I met all three of these gentlemen and got to talk to them. Tom Farrell from Montreal, Eric Muff from Toronto here. Uh, some of you may even know Eric. Eric Muff. Yeah. He's a Yeah, and uh, Phil Kevins from Verdun, Quebec. The three of them were best of mates. And they would go into a bar and Tom would approach the, the owner and say, if we put on a show, will you, will you provide us libations? And Tom would be the MC, and he'd tell a few jokes. Eric, he was a bard, he would tell some stories, and those that know Eric, his stories could be quite colorful. And Phil Kevin, well, he was a singer. And it was said his Danny boy would bring them to tears. And according to these three gentlemen, they never paid for a drink the whole time they were overseas. <laughs> Not everybody came back from shore leave well. <laughs> so the unfortunate part about this picture, you know, the two gentlemen that are helping this uh, sailor under the weather, you know, you, you see the smile, you see, right, you know, these, these, are, these are our guys, these could be our brothers, right? Both those men on the outside did not survive the torpedoing of the ship. Um, after the invasion, they were doing convoys up through the uh, Straits of Dover. And uh, they enjoyed that. It was a bit of a change of scenery. But they did say, uh, one of the stories several of them related was, uh, while they were over there, they, they were attacked by the Americans, unfortunately. While they were in, uh, doing the invasion, uh, they would routinely get strafed by um, or, or fall a shot as the V-1 rockets were going over, the anti-aircraft guns on shore by the British Army, the fall a shot would land on Trentonian. And while they were doing their working up exercises, a couple of Spitfires came and strafed down both sides of the ship just so the crew could see what it would like to come under air attack. So while they were in the Dover Straits, at one point escorting a convoy through, the big German guns on the French side opened up on their convoy. And these giant Volkswagen-sized shells started landing amongst their ship. Now, of course, they missed. But they all commented, we've been shot at by the Yanks. 
We had been shot at by the Brits. We had been strafed by the Air Force. It was about time the Germans took a few shots at us too. <laughs> this picture. This is not an official RCN photo. This is taken by a ship passing Trentonian. And the, the identification on this photo at the bottom there, you don't see it, is off Land's End, 22 February 1945. I, I love this picture and hate it at the same time. It, it's neat the way she's got just a little bit of a heel there. You're actually kind of looking down onto the ship. You can see into the bridge. You can see into that forward gun. You can see the lookouts in the aft section of the ship. You can see the gunners in the gun tubs. You can see the gunners along the uh, the 20 millimeters aft. From the monthly or from the incident report of Trentonian. From the, the incident report from Trentonian Skipper on the 25th of, uh, sorry, 22nd of February, most of their morning was spent in fog, and the fog finally lifted about 10.30. The next record into the incident report occurs just after noon, uh, just after 12 noon. So this picture had to be taken after 10.30 and before 12 noon on that day. Because at just after noon, a ship in Trentonian's convoy was torpedoed, the Alexander Kennedy. And she went down very quickly with the loss of one life. In hunting for the U-boat, Trentonian immediately made a turn to port. Found out after she had made or committed to her turn, the submarine was on the starboard side of the convoy. And as Trentonian was passing through the convoy, a torpedo struck Trentonian. Now, right at the after gun tub, you see the crosshatch uh, supports there? That's basically where the torpedo struck. Single torpedo right at the Chiefs and P.O.'s mess and, and the uh, engine room. Broke open the bulkhead. All those men that are standing in that gun tub and manning those depth charges, six of them were killed, five of them almost instantly. One man was trapped, unfortunately, in the wreckage, and although injured, he was still very much alive and very much awake, and they used everything they could get their hands on trying to pry the steel that was encasing his body. Uh, sadly, he was still screaming as his head went under the water. Wreckage from the aft end was landed on the, on the forecastle, and the gunners that you see at the four-inch gun there had to take shelter inside their gun shield in order not to be hit. Trentonian sank in 10 minutes, which was unusually long for a Corvette. Many of them went down in less than four. Six men lost their lives that day. Another 14 were wounded, several very seriously. And that's why I have a love-hate with that picture. When we did the book launch for my White Ensign Flying, I was fortunate that three of the veterans were still able to be there. And, and Fraser also joined us, which was wonderful. The cover of the book is a painting done by a gentleman by the name of Mark McGee. And he's the young fellow in the background there with the glasses on top of his head. He gave that painting to me and I said to him, I'll accept it for now and it will hang in my office while I write. But when the book is done, I want this painting to go to the library in Trenton because people have to see it. And when we did, did the unveiling, all three gentlemen were standing there in front. And the room was packed. There was about 140 in the council chamber, more than they had for regular council meetings. And the veil came off the painting and the room went absolute silent. You couldn't hear a noise other than click, click from the cameras. And for the longest time, the three of them, Gord Gibbons, 
uh, Jim Irwin and Bill Shields stood there and, and they just didn't move. And then Gord, he reached up, walked up to the painting and he put his hand right below the bridge and right after the, the gun shield there. And in a quiet voice that just boomed through the room, he said, I was standing right there when the torpedo struck. And with that, the room was done. So this is the stories we need to tell. We need to tell our stories. History is great. Dates and times and facts and figures are awesome for academics. I often ask people, have you heard about the Battle of Troy? And some people will say yes. And when I say Brad Pitt starred in it, everybody says yes. Helen, the face that launched a shot thousand ships. Most people have heard of that story. And that was several thousand years ago. The Battle of Atlantic is still living memory. And most Canadians don't know that history. We need to tell our stories. We need to talk about our experiences. We need to relate these, whether you're a Second World War veteran, Korean veteran, Cold War, <coughs> Persian, or, or just doing a fisheries patrol. It doesn't matter. Our stories we need to tell. And it's up to each of us to be that historian to future generations. Uh, for those of you that don't know, I'm pretty active on social media with Facebook and Twitter, doing a daily history post. Uh, these photos that you've seen today are all part of a collection and the ones that were up earlier. Uh, I'm now at over 1,800 personal photos, uh, photos from sailors themselves. I scan them and return them uh, with copies of the scans, and then I make them available to various museums, uh, naval museums across the country. For other researchers to use. Uh, if anybody wants to contribute, please let me know. And I'll leave you. This was a letter from one of Trentonian's uh, sailors just after Christmas in uh, 44. I know it says 45, but that's a typo. And this is a letter he sent to the city thanking them for the, the gifts that they had received. And you may not have read about us in the papers, but let me assure you that we are not idle and we are doing our share of the job. And someday you will be able to hear about our exploits. Thank you very much. This has been another in our series of webcasts produced by the Royal Canadian Military Institute in Toronto as a public educational service. You can find news of upcoming events and links to our webcast archives at www.rcmi.org. On behalf of the RCMI, this is Eric Morse saying goodbye for now and thank you for joining us.